Tous les acteurs du système ont vite compris que plus ils poseraient de questions sur la source de l'argent, moins il y en aurait. Switzerland Bermuda and Cayman Islands. Now, Amazon, I buy a book from you. Uh, I do it actually online. I'm a regular buyer. And when I buy a book, what I do is I get uh, Amazon.co.uk. That's what I'm, I'm told. Is that, is that correct? I mean, I can show you. <laughs> Plenty of, uh, in fact, I think you write to me every day with new offers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a UK company that I'm buying from. No, you're, you're purchasing for a, from a single European company. We operate a single European. No, I'm, I'm, I'm buying, from, it, says, it says to me, I'll show it to you. It says Amazon.co.uk. Is, um, is, is that actually to, to lie to me about the origins of your company? No, we're running... Uh, a, a single European uh, business. It comes with a UK. I am. I believe I'm dealing with a UK company. When did any book that I ever purchase ever get to Luxembourg? So we, we do not have. Uh, a have you got books in Luxembourg? We, we do not have a fulfilment centre in Luxembourg. We have our European uh, headquarters uh, in Luxembourg. When Chair buys her book, the money comes to Luxembourg and you just essentially pay a small amount back to the UK to have it delivered, is that so? Services such as operating the, the, the fulfilment centres, which is going to be receiving inventory, picking, packing, uh, and, and then passing on those products. How much of your Luxembourg business is sales into the UK? Mm. Uh, fortunately, uh, we've never broken out uh, figure, revenue figures on a country or website basis. Come on, you can't be serious. We, we, we operate a, a pan-European business. Those are the only, only figures we have ever broken up. I used to be a finance director of a pan-European business, and if somebody told me, what do you, ask me what do you sell in each country, I'd be fired immediately if I didn't have the answer to that question. That's so the, 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 those are numbers that, that we, we've never disclosed uh, publicly. Um, Will you disclose them privately? I, I'm very happy to see whether it's possible to disclose them privately to the committee. directeur de la direction des vérifications nationales et internationales qui est en charge en France du contrôle fiscal des grandes entreprises. Je suis chef donc d'un service des consultants, service des consultants qui comprend 16 personnes. Et nous on va essayer de déterminer si la société n'a pas manipulé ses prix de transfert entre chaque pays afin de minimiser sa base imposable. Dans mon métier, ce qui est le, le plus complexe, c'est de pouvoir dépasser dans les montages l'apparence juridique pour aller vraiment sur l'économie. Et essayer de comprendre vraiment le groupe dans son ensemble pour pouvoir déterminer si euh, il y a une juste répartition du profit entre chaque pays. Parce que souvent dans ces grands groupes, ils ont tendance à présenter la situation comme quoi les entités qui sont situées en France ne réalisent que des prestations annexes d'une valeur très faible, alors qu'en fait, c'est les sociétés qui sont localisées en France qui ont la relation avec la clientèle. C'est elles qui, la plupart du temps, qui vont négocier les contrats. Quand on prend chaque pays, c'est légal. Après, ce qui peut être un peu moins légal, et d'autant moins moral, euh, c'est l'articulation de ces différents régimes pour aboutir au résultat d'une imposition nulle, voire quasi nulle. 
il faut savoir ce qui se passe au-delà de nos frontières. Or, une administration fiscale n'est compétente qu'à l'intérieur de ces frontières. Les échanges d'informations internationaux, c'est à la demande. On ne peut pas se contenter de, de demander ces informations à la société. D'ailleurs, elle ne nous les donnerait probablement pas. Donc s'il y avait évidemment des échanges automatiques d'informations, ça nous faciliterait la tâche. Alors je dirais qu'on ne peut pas être, euh, je ne sais pas si l'image va parler, mais le, le village d'Astérix euh, qui tout seul va résister aux Romains euh, euh, multinationales. Bien entendu, la, la coopération entre les pays est très importante. L'impôt sur les sociétés, typiquement l'impôt sur les bénéfices des sociétés, ne, ne, ne peut plus être prélevé euh, séparément par les 27 euh, pays de l'Union Européenne. Au minimum, les, les pays de la zone euro, l'Allemagne, la France, l'Italie, la Belgique, l'Espagne doivent se mettre ensemble pour prélever leur impôt sur les sociétés avec une déclaration unique, une assiette unique. Faute de quoi, il n'y aura tout simplement plus d'impôt sur les sociétés à l'horizon de, 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 de 10 ou 20 ans. Dans un ordre où le principe des droits et des devoirs ne s'applique plus qu'à la classe moyenne et aux prolétaires, mais pas aux détenteurs de fortune et aux entreprises qui peuvent toujours enregistrer une activité ou des opérations dans une législation qui va louer complaisamment son droit pour permettre à ces acteurs d'agir indépendamment de toute contrainte, on peut dire que la démocratie devient une sorte de farce parce qu'elle ne s'applique plus qu'aux mêmes et elle permet aux plus puissants enfin, d'échapper à toute contrainte. Et c'est le sens même de l'État qui se dissipe dans cette, euh, on va dire, dans cette logique mondiale des paradis fiscaux. Comme toute compagnie, nous sommes obligés de faire deux choses. Une, de jouer par les règles. Et quand vous êtes international, vous devez prendre des décisions sur comment protéger votre propriété internationale et comment vous organiser. Et en deuxième lieu, de gérer nos coûts suffisamment pour satisfaire nos acheteurs. Et notre objectif comme compagnie est de. Donc vous minimisez vos taxes, même si c'est pas fair aux British taxpayers. Ce n'est pas fair aux taxes britanniques. Nous payons toutes les taxes que vous requirez de payer dans le UK. Nous avons payé 6 millions de taxes l'année dernière. Nous ne vous accusons pas d'être illégal, nous vous accusons d'être immoral. Fair share argument, I think, is a really, really difficult one to run, particularly for someone from a legal background. And, and it's sort of the buzzword, Apple isn't paying its fair share or Starbucks isn't paying its fair share. The, 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 and the debate is if you think the domestic US tax structure is wrong and that Apple should be paying US tax on the 150 billion that it has outside the US, change domestic US tax laws to have that happen. Lorsque le Québec a annoncé durant les dernières années qu'il avait l'intention d'augmenter l'impôt des grandes richesses, on a ressenti dans les bureaux de comptables une réaction presque instantanée. Les riches avaient vraiment l'intention de partir. Donc, sans réelle coopération fiscale internationale, une juridiction comme le Québec ne peut pas faire cavalier seul sans se faire brandir la menace d'exil. Unless we deal with the global industry as such, you know, we're not going to really address this problem um, uh, anywhere uh, nearly as effectively as we need to. And uh, all the players in this industry are basically organized across borders. Uh, if you look at Apple and Google and Microsoft and Facebook and the big pharmaceutical companies, uh, the multinationals, the grain companies that are uh, using their tax <laughs> lawyers and their accounting firms, Uh, to uh, park assets in low-tax jurisdictions. Um, you know, they're playing this game across borders. I think we have to organize effectively around these global industries uh, the same way. Les États sont souverains, on ne pourra jamais changer ça. Et donc il faut qu'ils se parlent, il faut qu'ils échangent, et il faut qu'ils aient des règles sur lesquelles ils se mettent d'accord. C'est ça le principal défi, qu'on réécrive les règles de zéro aujourd'hui, ou alors qu'on adapte les règles existantes. Et tout ceci est possible seulement si tous les pays s'y mettent. Et une fois qu'ils s'y sont tous mis, ils se surveillent les uns les autres. Donc on peut enfin enclencher ce qu'on appelle un cercle vertueux. Depuis 50 ans, L'OCDE travaille à éliminer les doubles impositions. 
Le problème qui est survenu au cours des 20 dernières années avec la globalisation, c'est qu'on est passé de l'élimination de la double imposition à l'organisation de la double non-imposition. Ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que les entreprises ne payent plus leurs impôts nulle part. Et c'est un problème grave auquel on est confronté aujourd'hui et que l'on veut traiter. And he basically said, yeah, we recognize this is an opportunity for the OECD to take back control of global tax policy. Les bases fiscales, c'est-à-dire les profits, en fait, sont réduits artificiellement. Et ce sur quoi euh, on se bat, c'est mettre fin au divorce qu'il y a entre la localisation des activités, là où vous avez les gens qui développent une marque, qui développent un produit, et la localisation du profit, qui est juste une société où il n'y a personne. Et dans le monde commercial aujourd'hui, la façon dont c'est est par créer des propriétés intellectuelles, c'est des patents, des copyrights et ainsi de suite. And then placing those pieces of intellectual property in the offshore world, and then billing the onshore companies for the use of what has been patented or copyrighted. So, for example, the name Starbucks might be uh, copyrighted and uh, trademarked, and now the trademark is sold to some offshore shell company. And everywhere in the world, there's a Starbucks, they'll pay for the use of the name. But that moves the profit to a place where there's no tax. Et donc, il faut mettre fin à ça. Il faut réconcilier l'endroit où se passent les activités et l'endroit où doivent être taxées les activités. Are we helping developed nations or are we helping emerging nations? Uh, and attempting to reduce or alleviate poverty, uh, or are we actually maintaining financial imperialism? And uh, I, I'm afraid I tend to the former, not the latter. Within the OECD membership, there are going to be some countries that will do everything possible to prevent them from moving forward to. to what should be the logical outcome, which is to move towards taxing companies, not on the basis of the legal fictions they create in the Cayman Islands and the Channel Islands, but on the basis of where their genuine economic activity takes place. Do you tax corporations as if they were a collection of separate entities loosely interacting with each other? And you know, when they put those entities in different tax havens and jurisdictions around the world, um, do you accept those, you know, the legal form of the corporation as the basis for taxing them? Um, or do you take a completely different philosophical view of what multinational corporation is and treat it as a single global unit, and then you decide where it's doing business, where it real business is, it's, you know, it's sales, it's, it's, it's payroll and so on. Where is the real business of that corporation? And then you allocate its global profits to each jurisdiction, you divide it up to each jurisdiction according to the real economic substance of what they're doing. If you do it that way, then you can completely ignore what the tax havens are doing. They can do whatever they like in tax havens, but if there's no real economic activity, they will get allocated a tiny proportion of the global income, and it doesn't matter if they tax that at zero percent. What's different about Google versus the other businesses you've been talking about? We're not selling books and we're not uh, making You're coffee. Advertising we're, we're, well, the services we provide to consumers are based on the computer science. That is what creates the economic uh, value uh, for What Google. What does Bermuda create? S'intéresser à à la réalité physique de, de l'économie numérique, c'est-à-dire à ces serveurs sur lesquels du code est exécuté et des données sont émergées, euh, bah, c'est s'exposer à ce que tout disparaisse au-delà des frontières et, et dans les nuages. Et c'est pour ça qu'il faut renverser le raisonnement et chercher un autre point d'ancrage euh, sur le territoire. Le droit fiscal n'est pas du tout préparé à, à, au rôle actifs que jouent désormais les consommateurs finaux dans la création de valeur. Euh, puisque jusqu'ici, ils raisonnent au contraire sur une séparation stricte. Il y a la création de valeur, puis la monétisation par la vente. Et aujourd'hui, l'activité spontanée de ces utilisateurs et, le, et les flux de données que cette activité génère, ça représente un, un actif 
dont ces entreprises font levier pour euh, créer encore plus de valeur et générer euh, du chiffre d'affaires et d'énormes bénéfices. What's happening with the internet, the basic internet was like that, but what's happened with it recently with the advent of the advertising business model and cloud computing and the way that everybody gives their data over to remote companies, it's, it's as if you just, you got on, you got your truck on the freeway and then the, the freeway supplied people who would recommend the route and would decide which truck stop you would be aware of. The highway system is generous. Uh, obviously, we pay for it with our taxes, but once we use it, it doesn't try to manipulate us. The internet has been very different. The internet has asked us to give all of our information to it in order to do anything. And this is a terrible idea because the information is the power. So people have to understand when they get these sort of free services like free search or free social networking, what they're really doing is they're giving over the true value, which is the data about themselves and their friends that can be used to drive these behavioral models that then can be used to concentrate fortunes. They're giving away the stuff that's really valuable. And what they're getting is trinkets. They're, 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 they're putting themselves in the position of lesser citizens who can't really bargain, can't, don't really have first class status in the economy anymore. Dès l'apparition de l'Internet dans les années 90, on a tout de suite identifié que ça pouvait devenir un nouveau canal de distribution pour des biens, des biens physiques. Et il s'est ouvert tout un tas de sites web, sur lesquels, de boutiques en ligne sur lesquelles on pouvait aller faire ses courses. Euh, beaucoup d'entreprises ont tenté leur chance, peu ont, ont réussi à, à s'en sortir durablement, et aujourd'hui une seule, Amazon, domine très largement ce marché. Et la raison pour laquelle Amazon domine ce marché, c'est parce que ils ont recueilli, collecté beaucoup de données, euh, toutes les traces que nous laissons quand nous visitons la boutique. Et si Amazon s'en sort mieux que les autres, c'est parce que Amazon est celle qui a su le mieux exploiter cette activité spontanée euh, qui est la nôtre dans une boutique. I mean, the books are here, the warehouses are here, the billing is here, the business is here, the customers are here. We have paid uh, in excess of 100 million uh, in payroll taxes uh, in the fast, last five years. We've paid uh, tens of millions in business rates uh, in the past five years. And I've heard this argument before. Let me just kill this argument because it really makes me cross. On the one hand, so does every other business. So the community-based uh, bookshop that you're putting out of business also pays business rates, also pays its PAYE, also pays VAT, actually probably pays VAT in a way that you don't, and, and uh, you uh, in the same way, and you're making it uncompetitive. And the other thing is you depend on the services that come out of the tax you pay. So, you know, you depend on the ability of your, uh, of, of, of getting your goods around, so you've got to get the truck, the roads in place, you depend on all those things. And probably worst of all, both you and Mr. Alsted employ people on probably minimum wage, if we're lucky, and then we, the taxpayer, pick up the tax credit bill for that too. So we're putting a lot of money back into the people you, you, you put, and you're not putting enough tax into our economy. That's what's riding us all. Voilà, pour, pour toute une série de raisons, l'économie numérique ne paye pas d'impôts dans, dans les États où elle a la majorité de ses utilisateurs. Et donc ça crée une situation complètement nouvelle, c'est que des entreprises meurent sous l'effet de cette révolution industrielle et cessent de payer des impôts. Et puis la marge se déplace vers les, des entreprises dont les bénéfices sont déclarés à l'étranger thésaurisés dans des paradis fiscaux. Et donc la seule manière de mettre fin à ce processus euh, vicieux et dangereux, c'est de refonder le droit fiscal pour lui permettre d'appréhender la façon nouvelle de créer de la valeur dans l'économie numérique. Cesser de considérer que la valeur se concentre à l'intérieur des organisations et s'ouvrir à l'idée que parce qu'on est dans l'économie numérique, la valeur est aussi créée par les utilisateurs, qui ne sont plus seulement des consommateurs finaux qui payent, mais des, des agents actifs de la création de valeur. 
parce que par ailleurs, dans cette économie numérique, il y a de moins en moins de, de machines et de moins en moins de salariés. Buggy whips were huge in Rochester, New York. And indeed, when automobiles took over, the buggy whip manufacturers closed shop. But what took over instead in Rochester was cameras. Kodak and Polaroid were headquartered there. And then there was this whole new world. Now, uh, Kodak had hundreds of thousands of employees, really good, solid, middle-class jobs. Kodak and Polaroid both went bankrupt. The new world of photography is Instagram, which had 13 employees and sold for a billion dollars to Facebook. Facebook is a giant public company controlled by one person. So what we're seeing is the use of digital networks to create intense, unbelievable, unprecedented concentrations of wealth within the market system, which is no longer the market system at all. It's something entirely different. It's a feudal system, and this is a great example of it. Buggy whips, cameras, Instagram. Employees, employees, no employees. We've created this engine of almost guaranteed concentration of wealth and power for whoever has the biggest computers, whoever's the most central position on networks. It's not a playing field, it's a funnel. And I think that what is happening is not simply more poverty, more inequality, more lack of opportunity. No, we're dealing with expulsions. At some point, more inequality is not simply more inequality. We need, it needs another name. People are being expelled from livelihoods. La grande interrogation de politique publique, c'est et si demain, euh, toute l'économie est colonisée par le numérique, si l'essentiel du travail est fait par des, par des utilisateurs non rémunérés, qui va nous payer et financer notre train de vie Et donc c'est ça l'enjeu de politique industrielle aujourd'hui, c'est prendre les gains de productivité générés par l'économie numérique et s'en servir pour faire émerger des nouveaux marchés sur lesquels se créeront les emplois de demain, qu'on ne connaît pas encore aujourd'hui. Et, et les assurances sociales, ce sont elles en, en réalité qui, euh, qui permettent d'amortir le choc d'une révolution industrielle et d'accompagner l'économie dans l'allocation de ressources optimales qui permet de retrouver un nouvel équilibre et euh, au capital de s'investir là où vont se recréer des emplois. Finance is basically a utility. Finance does not manufacture anything you can touch or feel, doesn't market anything you can see. None of those are its products. It's a utility that's supposed to serve the rest of the economy. What we've done, and certainly what financial leaders want to do, is almost turn that on its head and make the economy be driven by finance. If the financial sector were really providing value to the rest of the economy, the, fin the financial sector may get wealthier, but the rest of the economy should grow too. Their share of the pie should be the same. But what's happened is their sh share of the pie has doubled to levels that are this just almost unprecedented historically. One of the changes that's occurred is that at the end of the Second World War, the average time an investor held on to a share of stock was, was measured in years. And what's happened is that as the technology has advanced and practices have advanced, the average time of holding on to shares of stock first fell to an hour, then minutes. And more recently, it's been measured as the average holding period is 22 seconds.
many of the holding periods aren't measured in seconds at all. <laughs> They're measured in uh, thousandths of a second or a millionth of a second or a billionth of a second. And the turn is just like completely instantaneous. That activity is activity that has nothing to do with creating jobs for anybody other than the uh, people who work not too far from where we're speaking right now on Wall Street. We now have this extraordinary phenomenon called high frequency trading. People who do high frequency trading have to get their computers so close to the computers of the central stock exchange or whatever is the exchange that the fiber optics that they connect them will be able to buy and sell something in way less than a second less than a tenth of a second and of course at that level they can't possibly be making an informed judgment about what uh, that equity is worth. They are simply switching on computers that have what are called algorithms, rules of the game written into each other, and these are computers just chasing each other's round and round in circles. Now, I think there's a debate as to whether or not that does harm, but I think it's certainly useless. I don't think there's any social value. This is not making the allocation of capital more efficient. It's not usefully determining whether the savers of a pension fund give their money to this company or that company according to its products or its, uh, its entrepreneurial uh, uh, capabilities. That's the useful activity, but we often go beyond that to levels of activity which don't serve a useful purpose. Seventy percent of financial trading happens, and I'm quoting, in black pools. Now, you may think that black pools is the language of, you know, those of us who do work on the informal economy, on illegality, etc. No, that was Bernanke, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. That means that the Federal Reserve is unable to really understand what exactly is happening there. What's really happening in the dark pools is people are trying to escape detection by some of these computers, these robots that are, that are trying to detect behavior before it actually occurs. So, so many things get affected, not just the securities markets, but fuel prices for uh, people who heat their homes and fill their cars, food prices for people in developing countries. All of these things get affected, and that's, that's really problematic. Une partie des acteurs du monde de la finance, une partie des acteurs ont complètement perdu de vue les valeurs fondamentales, les principes essentiels du métier de la banque et de la finance. Le premier texte écrit, le code d'Amourabi à Babylone, on énonce quelques principes fondamentaux du métier de banquier. Par exemple, euh, il ne doit pas y avoir contradiction, conflit d'intérêt entre votre intérêt de banquier et celui de vos clients. Quand je reçois de l'argent d'une tierce personne, Je dois gérer cet argent en bon père de famille. En bon père de famille. C'est écrit sur le code d'Amourabi. Et il faut reconstituer cette éthique des métiers de la finance. Les valeurs fondamentales, les principes que ceux qui exercent cette activité doivent constamment garder à l'esprit parce qu'ils exercent 
une mission d'intérêt public. Finance is supposed to spread risk, manage risk, but instead finance has become the greatest source of risk. The financial sector has expanded boundlessly both in its size and its profitability while at the same time destroying the world's finances. I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. And yet we're all civilized, we're all nice as we should be. We respect the system we've all agreed to and we accept the benefits that have accrued to people who've participated in schemes that are mathematically absurd, just pure nonsense. Uh, but we cannot sustain it. It's simply impossible. We cannot continue. When we talk about Robinhood taxes or financial transaction taxes, we're talking about imposing the tax on only one small part of what the finance sector actually does. We're saying that trading, that is uh, trading assets back and forth, should be taxed. If you are an investor and, and buy some stocks a day and hold them for two years, five years, ten years, whatever, um, you would pay a small fee going in and a small fee going out. But that would be trivial to you. to tax every financial transaction. That has a single, nice, simple aim, a bit of redistribution. It doesn't kill the monster, but it tells the monster, you know, every time you do one of your monstrous activities, no matter how tiny, you redistribute a bit. Those transactions, because of the tax, will have to pay the tax, and, and, and so they won't be um, as profitable. You can, you'll cut back on those kinds of transactions, so the financial transaction tax will actually reduce risk in the economy and risk to the system to try to avoid another crash. By the way, I'm really scared. Another much bigger one that can't be stopped. The officer, Captain Herbie Johnson, had his people up there, and uh, fire got really nasty really quick, and there was a flashover, and Herbie and uh, one of his people were caught on the second floor, and uh, Herbie suffered some pretty bad injuries, and he didn't make it, so. Shortly after that, we got a visit on my shift from the mayor, and Mayor Emanuel came in, so he offered his condolences, and he also said that he had just come from speaking to Herbie Johnson's family again and to see how they were doing, to check in on them, see if they needed anything. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe it was a mayor's thing to do for him to come to us and do that. I thought it was a really classy gesture. Then he goes with that same demeanor and says, now I want to talk about conditions. So right away, right away, the alarm bells are going off in my head because he used to come around, he was coming around to the firehouses before he got elected, when he was campaigning, talking about the same issue. And uh, what he would tell us is, there's no easy choices, your pension is badly underfunded, if you guys want to have something going forward, we're going to have to make some tough choices to make sure that you do. We don't take care of the inherited past, be honest with our employees, be honest with our taxpayers, we're going to be stealing from our future, and that's just the wrong course to do. So. I don't know what possessed me. I guess I'm sometimes a troublemaker once in a while. So I sort of raised my hand and I said, you know, I've got an idea. While our pension fund has been suffering and people have been losing their homes, uh, we know there's one sector of our economy that's doing pretty well because we bailed them out. It's the banks, it's the investors. If we were to institute a tiny financial transaction tax on the Board of Trade, 
and the mercantile exchange, we could recoup some of these losses and we'll be getting it back from the people who squandered it in the first place. They won't notice it's missing. It'll, it could just be a tiny tax and you could just bring in tremendous amounts of revenue and solve some of these budget crises. And he said, I don't support that. If you go down to Springfield, our state capital, you won't find any legislators who support that. If you think it's a good idea, you should run for office. The important thing, I think, the, with, the, with the financial transaction tax to me, is it's not just practical, it's also symbolic. It's saying, look, we are not going to let you, investors, bankers, do whatever you want and cause all this damage to all these people who you see as, I know, beneath you are not as important. If there's some value in what you do, you'll do it with a smaller profit margin. You'll do it and pay more taxes. And if there's no value in what you do, you know what? We're going to make it illegal. But until we figure that out, you're going to pay whatever we decide you're going to pay to help recoup some of this loss that you've created, to help repair some of this damage that you've caused. But I think if we, but we have to change our thinking, though, as, as, a, as a society in general. Do you want to put another coat of paint on the bond trader's boat? Or do you want to make sure your firefighter has a pension to, to go to when he retires? Take your pick. It's an easy choice as far as I'm concerned. The financial transactions tax, at a time when we're struggling to get our economies growing, is quite simply madness. That is why Britain has been arguing for a pro-business agenda in Europe. The Griffin. It's, it's present as a, as, a, as a symbol of the city at the gates of the city, so you can see it all around the square mile. But it's more than simply a, a symbol. It seems to, in my mind, express something of the spirit of the city. And I experience that spirit as demonic because it's the only way that I can understand how this system works, because Individually, the people in the city are good people. They're not bad people. But there is within this system something at work that causes us to uh, exploit the world's resources, that is causing us to act against our own interests. Now, of course, it is right that the financial sector should pay their share. But if you look at the European Commission's own original analysis, that showed that a financial transactions tax could cost the GDP of the European Union and could reduce it by 200 billion euros. It could cost almost 500,000 jobs. I could imagine that if it produces somewhat less financial activity, there might be, at the end of the day, somewhat less people employed in the financial services industry across the world. But I'm a sufficient believer in the dynamism of capitalism that they'd find other jobs to do. And I actually think that the, we are overproducing financial services and we'd probably find better jobs for them to do. I mean, again, it comes back to the uh, French attitude. If you charge people 75% rate of income tax, aren't we going to have a lot more money? No, because people will stop paying it because they'll either move away from it or they'll devise ways of avoiding it. Um, so, and of course, it is only in the West, so most of the trade will move to, to Asia with no intention, I can tell you, of putting on any form of transaction tax. Um, there's a couple of problems with that. One, South Korea has a financial transaction tax. Taiwan has a financial transaction tax. Singapore has a financial transaction tax, as do several of the smaller markets. Those who are against it, who just don't like it, what they do is they try to persuade enough countries to be against it that they can then say, oh, well, there's no point in the rest having it because it will move to those against it. The City of London guards its freedom to do exactly as it wants jealously. Um, it's not going to sign up to anything that's going to impose a tax, however small, um, on the uh, vast volume of money that passes through the city every day. Um, it's not so much because they would lose huge amounts of money, 
there's so much money in the system, I doubt they would even notice it. I think their resistance is more because it smacks of the beginning of the possibility of a global tax regime. We're celebrating the spirit of the Occupy movement and the nurses globally from 16 countries are bringing the same message to their governments that we want to end austerity measures and pass the Robin Hood tax. People used to, in their positions, use that money to invest, to invest in our country, to invest in people, and they're not doing it anymore. We saw that with the banks. They're just hoarding it. And as a nurse, I would say they're probably a little bit mentally ill. It's not normal to want to hoard all that money. It's more than you could use in a lifetime. And the people in this country need it. They're on a planet with other people, they're in a country with other people, and that money needs to be put to good use. We pay sales tax on everything we buy. We're used to doing that. And we, if we have to pay sales tax on food and items of clothing and the things that we use every day, they should be paying a sales tax too, and that's what we're asking. And this is revenue that would come in each year from the private sector into the public sector. And the impact that it actually will have on our economy is enormous. So that's one of the idea, that's one of the reasons why people like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, George Soros, all of whom are certainly no, you know, left-wing liberal, have all supported the Robin Hood tax. I grew up in the segregated South of the 1950s, and I saw the kinds of inequality there, and that angered me. And now when I look at what's happened, not just in the U.S., but in a lot of wealthy countries over the last, particularly the last 30 to 35 years, and see the huge shift of income upwards to mostly 1% of the population, in which, by the way, financial employees are overrepresented in that 1% very significantly. When I see that, I think that level of inequality is not justified, but it also doesn't, doesn't build the economy over the long run for the rest of us. And so this is a tax that, as we like to say in the Robin tax movement, is not a tax on the people, it's a tax for the people. There's not a problem with coming up with technical solutions to these problems that we've identified. It's a political problem. It's an organizing problem. It's a problem that the major parties have been captured by this global haven industry and the multinational companies that uh, you know, it represents uh, and the wealthy individuals that it represents. Uh, and left to their own devices, those parties will not step forward uh, and advocate these kinds of reforms. We need to put pressure on them. La question des paradis fiscaux est aussi importante du point de vue politique que ne l'est la question des euh, variations climatiques du point de vue euh, des écosystèmes. C'est un combat à long terme. Peut-être que de notre vivant, on n'en verra pas la fin. Mais il reste que, euh, d'ores et déjà, euh, les peuples doivent, je pense, réapprendre à se donner des institutions qui leur ressemblent. Des institutions qui leur ressemblent et qui sont la médiatisation de leur volonté en tant que, que, que corps public. So, arguably, although the foundations of the fiscal state have certainly been eroded by offshore finance, the fact that we now know about it means that perhaps we have the possibility of a greater democratic handle on it. This is something that now affects individuals. Until 2008, perhaps we didn't see it so clearly. What the bankers do has direct consequences for every individual, and we can now see that. The reason, in fact, that the Tax Justice Network and the tax justice movement in general are growing as a worldwide phenomenon is because precisely because this experiment we ran with liberalization of markets didn't work. We don't have a welfare state anymore. We've had 30 years of dismantling it.
il y a un risque si on n'est pas capable de recréer des règles du jeu, de les faire respecter, de rétablir la transparence et la confiance des citoyens, il y a un risque qu'un jour les citoyens disent « puisque ça ne marche pas, ça ». Puisque la démocratie ne marche pas, eh bien, on va choisir autre chose. And in Europe, we can talk about, you know, the corporate state, and it has another name, and that is fascism. And fascism is stalking the streets of Europe. Once again, you can see it on the streets now, in countries which are failing, and that in many cases they're failing because the governments, like the Greek government of Greece, was incapable of taxing effectively. In an era of globalized capital markets, you can't preserve national sovereignty without a framework for international cooperation. International law has to change, and these companies have to be held accountable for tax law, tax evasion, no matter what country they're in. And I think it's just like, like other things, like human rights abuses, you know, like work standards worldwide, like this stuff has to become globalized. It's a joke to think that you know, these countries are going to be held accountable by one certain nation's laws on tax. Like, it has to be a global thing, and it really has to evolve to that point, I think. La mondialisation sans réelle coopération et coordination fiscale entre les pays est une erreur de parcours qui va être jugée importante avec le temps. Et quoi qu'on fasse, il faut toujours protéger le principe de la juste part d'impôts si durement acquis au fil des siècles, parce que lorsqu'on s'en éloigne, c'est la démocratie qu'on met en péril. In the case of uh, uh, political power, we not only see this enormous concentration of wealth beyond the realm of taxation, but the reverse side of that is increased representation without taxation for those interests. And so they have the best of both worlds, um, you know, citizens of nowhere for tax purposes and super representation uh, without taxation, you know, and that's just not a solution we can live with. At the end of the day, this is the tax haven, the offshore system is a project of the world's wealthiest and most powerful people. And they will always be pushing for this system to exist. And the, the, the challenge is to get the people to sort of push back against that and to understand how it's happening and to, to know how to push back.